just I'll just press the button so I don't know what it tastes like. Okay. Oh, I've got it. Oh, oh, thank you. I can keep in the head that one. I reckon the favourite bit has got to be Bella. Uh, with the f*** you grasshopper and the guns. <laughs> Good to see Paul Freeman back on the big screen. Oh yeah. Well, he hasn't changed either. I was surprised to find out. Did you know he played Ivan Ooze? Yeah, I'd never seen that. You know, I heard about He was telling me about that, that he had, uh, <laughs> they had merchandise, like, tubs of ooze with his face on. But, uh, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. I did see him in, um, Double Team. Yeah. John Claude Van Damme and Dennis Rodman and yeah. and Paul Freeman was the baddie in that, which is quite bizarre. Stuart Wilson is that the yeah, other one. Yeah, exactly that I, right. I love Stuart Wilson. I was so kind of happy that he sort of did it, you know. And that was one of the amazing things because I was watching it going, wow, I can an American like Stuart Wilson into the yeah, I mean, English. I'm, yeah, and I didn't even realise. Is that because you see like the Harry Potter films purely focusing on English actors? And they're big enough names that like Americans can go. Is that was that a conscious decision? To there was a there was a, an idea to kind of cast uh, for the people playing the sort of the Sanford villages to cast actors who had been in notable genre films. Yeah, you know we wanted to also like have like within the casting the idea that the um, police officers uh, were mainly kind of the comedy actors and the rest of the village were all you know really dramatic yeah. thesps. Yeah, yeah. Like living legends, Timothy Dalton, yeah, Stuart Wilson, yeah. Paul Freeman, Kenneth Cranham, Billy Whitelaw, Edward Woodward, you know, that was, there, there was definitely something in that. And that was great, so that kind of when you saw them all together, you would kind of think that, that wow, this is a high-powered uh, neighbourhood watch meeting. <laughs> With these like big names, like after Sean, are they coming to you or are you still going to them? Or? Uh, a bit of both. I mean, in the case of like Jim Broadbent and Paddy Constantine, they both approached us after seeing Shaun of the Dead and saying how much they liked it and they said, you know, and you know, you do get people say like, um, oh, I loved your film, I'd love to work with you in the future if there was something that would be right. And then whilst you're writing, you know, like as soon as we started writing the Frank Butterman character, it was like, this is Jim, this is Jim's part. Yeah, this yeah. is so Jim. And the same with Paddy Considine, we started writing that part for him. In other cases, you know, um, you you just go through the usual channels of approaching the agents and Timothy Dalton had seen it with his son in LA and yeah. Billy Whitelaw's son was a big fan of Shaun of the Dead. So, so yeah, it's, you know, that's how it works. Are you still sort of geeking out? like? Oh, no, you definitely kind of geek out. And it's kind of fun, like, meeting them and getting to ask them, like, questions and stuff. So I had, I had a lot of fun with, like, Billy Whitelaw and, and Edward Woodward yeah. and Timothy Dalton just asking them lots of questions about things. I didn't really talk to, like, Timothy about Bond much, actually. I talked to him more about Flash Gordon. Yeah. I wanted to know all about Flash Gordon. Yeah, I'm a Rocketeer man. Myself. Yeah, which is, yeah, and he's very proud of that as well. Yeah. He's very proud of the Rocketeer. You were talking about a lot of your influences. Woody Allen, the Zucker Brothers particularly. But um, well, these are just comedy influences. Yeah, just That's comedy. What, yeah, yeah. There's obviously like a whole load of other like horror and action and, you know, thriller sort of directors yeah, as well. Yeah. Obviously it's a comedy film and there's comedy in it, but it's sort of... Um, you don't spoof it, and there's genuine sort of horror, and there's genuine sort of risk and stakes and all of that. Um, is that a conscious decision to like keep back from making it sort of silly? Yeah, I think sort of like it's it's you know kind of if you look at the Zucker Brothers films and stuff, and even the great ones, is they're great, but they only exist from joke to joke. Mm. Um, whereas if you have a film where you're invested in the characters or there's some level of tension, even if it's kind of tongue in cheek or like in terms of the murder sequences and stuff you know you want people to kind of like have the same thrills as they would watching kind of like a, a more straightforward genre film so absolutely yeah it's like you want the murder scenes to be tense you want the splatter to be disgusting yeah, you want kind yeah. of like people to you know to get amped up in the same way that they do you want kind of people to kind of like whoop you know when somebody fires their gun up in the air <laughs> well, I think the thing that happened with the Zucker Brothers is that, unfortunately, I mean, I love Airplane, I love Top Secret, Police Squad series is great, but not only did they split off and do separate ones like Hot Shots and yeah. Jane Austen's Mafia, not that I've ever seen that one, but then like, look, then you got the, all the rip-off ones as well, like Spy Hard, and then it just became, and now you get date movie, scary movie, epic, epic movie, movie yeah, yeah. and like, they've become so... When, the, when the, those films first came out, the airplane films, there was su such a kind of like, a rush of like, um, 
pure kind of like gag fest, even more yeah. than what Mel Brooks had done. And Mel Brooks has obviously made some classics. Yeah. Um, but Airplane was just so kind of committed to the form of just kind of like a furious gag rate that you only really see now on animated shows or mm. Arrested Development. I think, I think it'd be very difficult for somebody to do one of those type of films and make it really fresh because it's sort of like the, the, the style of it has become so kind of hackneyed, hackneyed now, it's a shame. The, the films that do it well are where something has got a completely different spin on something, like Team America yeah. is a really great way of doing that vibe of a film. We had a screening of Hot Fuzz in LA the other day which we invited kind of friends and people who wanted to see it and um, you know the first three people to arrive was Matt Stone, Trey Parker and Shane Black. So that was like sort of a good mix in terms of Australia. I was thinking, Shane Black has come to see Hot Fuzz. Great. Oh, wow. And did, it, did you find out what he thought of Hot Fuzz? Or? He gave us a press quote, which is cool. Yeah. He said something like, that, on behalf of the nation, I demand a sequel. So I'm a big, you know, big fan of his, and I thought Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. Very cause... underrated film. I mean, I probably, there's, there's still quite a few people in comedy that I'm a big fan of that I've never met. I've never met Christopher Guest. Yeah. Or like Larry David, or like sort of... Uh, you know, there's a lot of people I'd still like to meet. I met Matt Gronig, which is good. And the, uh, uh, Do you have any idea what the next project is going to be? Or? Well, there's a couple of things in the pipeline that I've been developing. Simon and Nick are developing uh, a film, and then me and Simon are talking about a film for all three of us to do. So there's various things on the cards, and mm -hmm. um, some things that I was developing before Hot Fuzz even. So um, what the next one is, I don't know right now. Are you definitely wanting to go to other genres? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd hate it if we became predictable. I mean, the, when we were writing Hot Fuzz, our kind of initial inspiration was, let's do something completely different. Yeah. You know, and like the sort of Hot Fuzz, you know, even though there are references to Shaun the Dead, like tonally and Simon's performance and Simon's character is so different from Tim in Space and Shaun in Shaun of the Dead. Mm. So you know, we, we, we were trying to be unpredictable by doing a cop film, <laughs> but now it sort of seems like sort of a, a just, for people just a natural progression. So whatever we do next, we do, don't want to sort of like be like, uh, hey, yeah, let's do Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I would never do Star Wars because I don't like it that much. Really? No. Not, not anymore. Oh, uh, but the original ones? I no, I kind of, the whole thing has been sullied for me. Because I'm like gore-wise, I'm a little bit squeamy. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> That's the desired effect. Yeah, especially, like, I don't want to give anything away uh, about the movie or whatever. Um, but when the chapel falls on the guy's head and it splatters. <laughs> so, obviously, that's a CGI effect. Yeah, a bit of both. A bit of both. Half physical. Yeah. We but actually did drop something onto her head. Yeah. A prosthetic head. Does it change the tone of the movie that it has some of that sort of CG incorporated into it? I think sort of just digital makes practical things a bit easier. The, yeah. the truth is is that there are all they are all practical effects. Like the you know, the the, the what you use digital for is to tidy things up. So mm. it's not a digital head and it wasn't a digital rock and some of the brains and stuff weren't digital. We we did it for real. Yeah. And then you use digital to kinda of just make it a bit more slick basically. Okay. Same thing with some of the impaling or any of the any of them the splatter sequences have physical elements in them. When I was at school, yeah. I um, in graphic, I went to the graphics and I made a board game. You had to make a board game, and my board game was called Nightmare on Ramsey Street. And you could play uh, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger. And who was the other one? I think maybe the sort of the Alien Queen. And the <laughs> object of the game was to kill the cast of Neighbours. And so I had like a sort of a board of like Ramsey Ramsey Street and all the different houses and you could go around and kind of massacre the inhabitants of Ramsey Street. Are we going to see that game released or is it? No, I don't know. I've got it somewhere at home. I was, I was 14 when I made that. Okay. But I, I did used to watch Neighbours. I know who Sky Mangle is by name, but I don't know what, uh, I, I don't know who the current cast are. Who's um, still in there for me is, is Harold? Harold's still in it. I kind of start to tune out around the point of Bouncer's dream. Okay, well, I'm going to have to... Bouncer's Christmas Dream, where, like, Guy Pearce uh, was dressed up as, like, a uh, little drummer boy. Right. I, I miss that particular... You should check it out. It's something amazing, especially now. Uh, 
I for you can have that one for free. Nightmare on Ramsey Street. <laughs> the, the most amazing thing about doing Shaun of the Dead is I got to meet pretty much all of my favorite directors. Some of the, uh, there's still a, cu a couple that I've never met. I never met John Carpenter. Um, I met Ethan. Uh, I met Joel Cohen the other day, which was uh, I was I was so and I, I kind of. I had to kind of play it kind of cool because I sort of, uh, well, I sort of told him and I sort of said, I know it sounds awful, but like, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without like the things that you and your brother make, you know, it's just, you know, so. And they're very, you know, sort of very uh, encouraging and kind of want to know what's next and like sort of in some cases collaborating. I mean, uh, you know, even aside from the Grindhouse thing, Robert Rodriguez did some music for music, all of yeah, us yeah. for, you know, just for a hoot, you know. He, and he did his music without seeing the rest of the film, which I thought was really funny. Yeah. I just sent him the two scenes that he was doing, and then and he kind of like, and I had done the music within like 72 hours. Are you getting that you're sort of the new, like, influence for all the people rising up today? I don't know. I mean, you know, I certainly get asked a lot of kind of, um, you know, kind of meeting kind of young filmmakers. I get asked a lot about how I got my start, and so... If that's, you know, helping influence people, then great, you know. People who've been very supportive and, like, um, really enthusiastic, like Quentin and Peter Jackson. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. It's, it's, so, it's so cool and, and getting to kind of... And Sam Raimi as well, like, you know, yeah. like got to go down to the Spider-Man 3 set and stuff like that. And it's just like, what a laugh. It's just brilliant. Just not, like, secretly, have you seen Venom or, like... Like, is that one of the perks no. of, do you get... When you're collaborating, no, you no, no. The secret, no. Uh, no, I went down the day that I went down. I don't think even Toby Maguire was there. I I saw a bit of like Sandman's origin being filmed. Yeah. So the day that I was down there was just Thomas Hayden Church. All right. Well, on that, cause I actually no, I am playing Venom. You are. That's the scoop. I'm playing Venom. I thought, yeah, man. Yeah, okay, well that makes sense. <laughs> um, so what sort of like, what are you bringing to the role of Venom? I just, you know, I just think of like, I'm, you know, I'm in really good shape at the moment. I can really fit into that tight kind of like sort of black, you know, spandex outfit, mm -hmm. and I can dislocate my jaw. Yeah. That's so nice. I can, um, you know, I can. Do well, the big aesthetic ah, tongue you know. or your actual tongue? Or? That's my actual tongue. Yeah. yeah. That was great. Thank you guys. Thank you, you so much. You got a worldwide scoop on me playing Venom as well. Yeah. I'm, that's going straight. Did you reveal something here today? I'm playing Venom in Spider-Man Three. Fantastic.